Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to welcome you to another lecture in our UFG Peaceful Change series. And I'm very happy to welcome for today's talk, Professor Irmgard Marvel from the University of Vienna. Uh, she is a professor at the Department of European, International and Comparative Law at the university. Um, Irmgard, uh, thanks a lot uh, for being here. Thanks a lot for giving us uh, to our, the, for, 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 uh, for speaking to us today. Um, under normal circumstances, you would get a big round of applause now here. Um, it's at the moment, for whatever reason, it's not like that. We'll be very happy uh, to have you. Uh, I just want to say a, a few words about, uh, about Irmgard and about, uh, about the talk. Um, jokingly, in one of my email announcements, I wrote the world is not enough. Yeah? So that's uh, basically a little bit how it is today. Um, so we're going to talk about space. And I don't know how it is for you as an, as an, as an audience. Um, I actually don't know much about it. I'm very interested in it, don't know much about it. I looked a little bit uh, through Professor Marvel's slides already. It's very, very interesting and, and lots of things that I've not thought about uh, before. The uh, title of her talk is The Role of Private Actors in the Formation of International Law, the Example of the International Law of Outer Space. And, um, and Professor Marbe is uh, not only a very accomplished professor of law at the University of Vienna, uh, but she's also very much a practitioner in terms of space law. And just to highlight a few things, uh, she is heading the Austrian National Point of Contact of the European Center for Space Law. Uh, she is a member of the Directorate of Studies of the International Institute of Space Law. And she's also a regular member of the Austrian delegation on the United Nations Committee for the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. Uh, so for all of those reasons, we're very, very happy to have you. And uh, without any further ado, uh, Jungert, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Markus, for this very kind introduction. And for this invitation, I really appreciate uh, this interest in, in space law, which is uh, uh, yeah, quite a, a special field of international law, an exotic field perhaps, uh, but is, it is taught at the University of Vienna in the framework of public international law. It's part of our curriculum even, because we of course teach also the law of uh, spaces outside national jurisdiction. And this is was, uh, what space is about. It has some similarities with the high seas and the law of the sea. So also there is no national territorial uh, sovereignty, but still there is a need to have rules in place for human activity in these areas, in outer space, as well as uh, on the high seas. Uh, humans are active and they want to do things, they want to use, they want to explore it. And this is, uh, it is about the use and exploration um, here in, in the law of the sea. And now I'm talking about uh, the law of outer space. Use includes commercial use. This is understood. It's uh, use, it's the term in a broad sense. Use includes commercial use and exploration, of course, for scientific purposes. And um, my topic today deals with the legal framework which traditionally has been written and coined by states, obviously. So by the United, in the frame of the United Nations, uh, there have been treaties, I will uh, briefly introduce them. But in the recent time, in recent time, we see private actors increasingly taking a more active role, including in rulemaking. And this is a development which is not only taking place in the law of outer space, but also in other areas. And that's why I think this talk is also interesting, not only for those who are interested in space law, but also for those who are interested in these new developments of private actors, which increasingly get involved into rulemaking norm, creating standards uh, on the international level in parallel or as an alternative forum uh, to states, because it has turned out that the lawmaking by states takes 
a lot of time, probably more than in the past, when we consider that all the five space treaties were uh, concluded uh, between 67 and 79, but five treaties. <laughs> and today it takes a much longer time and, and with an un, um, secure outcome. We do not know today when now um, discussions are going on on the further development of the law of the sea, for example, that they will ultimately succeed at all. So private actors are taking <laughs> action. And I, I want to discuss with you whether this is a welcome or to what extent this is a welcome development or unwelcome development and what are the dangers uh, in that development, what are the chances, but also the dangers. And so this is what this talk will be about, private actors in the formation of international law. Um, overview a little bit of my talk. So briefly present what is there, what is the international traditional international law of, based on treaties. And we have also a couple of sets of principles uh, agreed by the United Nations General Assembly and adopted by the General Assembly. So still traditional, even if not binding, but um, uh, soft law recommendations by the General Assembly. But now this new development is um, uh, primarily drawn by one of first the space agencies. So what is the role of space agencies here? They are not the states, they are space agencies are separate in a way. They are financed by the state, but they are separate entities and the role of industry. And the cases which are discussed is in the first um, instance, uh, space debris in, in the second uh, space resources. And these are very current uh, topic uh, topics and very pressing topics also, specifically space debris. Um, here is the overview one one slide of five treaties, the famous five treaties of space law. And they started in 1967 with the Outer Space Treaty. So there's a abbreviation, the nickname, so to say, is Outer Space Treaty. Um, it has a very long title, but you see it's about governing activities of states in the exploration and use of outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies. The number uh, shows us the number of ratifications as of the 1st of January 2020. These are the most recent numbers I could get. Perhaps they will be new in this year, but last year it was 110 and 23 additional signatures. So they have not ratified the treaty, these countries, but additionally uh, signed. And so they are also quasi bound by them. They shall not defeat the object and purpose of the treaty. The second was the rescue and return agreement. It was about the rescue and of astronauts and return of astronauts and return of uh, space objects. Also 98 uh, state parties. So they are considered as very successful treaties. So a large uh, number of state parties. And what is significant, the most important spacefaring nations have ratified. So the spacefaring nations have ratified, including the United States, uh, Russia, China, Japan, all the European um, countries have at least ratified the Outer Space Treaty. You see the number in ratification decreases a little bit with the time and with the speciality. So they are more special. The Rescue and Return Agreement and the others, the following are the specialized agreements. So the Outer Space Treaty is something like a constitution of outer space. And the other four are normal laws, we could call them in parallel to our national law system. Um, which are more specific and um, address very specific issues as the title indicates rescue and return of astronauts here and space objects. Liability convention addresses specifically liability issues. Launching states absolute liability is characteristic, very specific to space uh, law because of the dangerous uh, nature of the activity. So there's absolute and unlimited liability of states for uh, damages caused by space objects on earth. 98 ratifications, that's a significant number and 19 additional signatures. Registration is important for every space object must be registered um, both at the United Nations and at the national level. This is very important for jurisdiction and control um, and uh, of these space objects. So we know who is responsible and liable for the space object. And the Moon Agreement 1979 uh, is governing the activities of states on the moon and other celestial bodies. 
Um, you see that's the least successful treaty, only 18 ratifications and four additional signatures. It has entered into for, uh, force because it only needed five, five ratifications. So it is in force, but it is considered as a not so successful agreement because particularly the United States, uh, Russia, and the other spacefaring nations, uh, except France, which has uh, signed it, uh, but they are not party to it. Probably it was what uh, it was a bit too futuristic at the time because it deals about um, yeah space resource exploitation and use, and this at that time was very premature probably. But now we see it is a topic uh, that is uh, currently addressed, and the question is: Does the Moon Agreement fulfill its role or not? So, you know, we see that's the first dilemma which we see. So it was a little too early probably at the time, and and now. Times have passed and probably it's not uh, any more appropriate to the current um, needs, but that's the state as it is. So the binding treaties are here in place. Um, they have been elaborated by the uh, UN COPOS, which Marcus mentioned, which is uh, the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space which was created by the United Nations very shortly after the uh, launch of uh, Sputnik in 57. So it was created in 58, already 59, as an ad hoc committee and became a permanent committee uh, soon thereafter. And since then is meeting annually. Annually, we, the United Nations has a meeting on the peaceful uses of outer space. And for our benefit, since 1993, this meeting is taking place in Vienna because all the space uh, agenda has moved to Vienna from New York, where it originally was. And since 1993, the COPOS meetings take place in Vienna. And we have also the secretariat to it, which is the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs, is uh, also situated in Vienna since 1993. So we in Vienna are, of course, in a very good position to talk about space law. Um, COPOS has two subcommittees. Uh, the legal subcommittee and the scientific and technical subcommittee. And of course, it was the legal subcommittee who, who drafted these treaties. However, the scientific and technical subcommittee is very important uh, also for legal issues because it informs uh, about the current technological developments, the current scientific and technical developments. And of course, you need to know what's going on in order to be able to regulate it. So the two subcommittees work um, first so they meet in february every year and then the legal subcommittee meets in april and the main meeting of the COPOS is in june every year so we have six weeks of space sessions every year in vienna and i'm pleased uh, and honored to be part of the austrian delegation to these uh, deliberations un general uh, Prince, uh, general assembly principles resolutions they followed afterwards you see the numbers uh, 82, 86, 92, 96, uh, they responded to new technological developments and the new uses of outer space. Uh, so it was first direct television broadcasting, which caused concern to some states that would be an uh, intrusion into their national sovereignty if there is information coming which is unwanted and can be received on the ground. So should there be prior authorization of these broadcastings or not. So this was the debate in the principles on direct television broadcasting. Then the next step was remote sensing of Earth from outer space. So again, probable of, of, of uh, interference, intervention, and lack uh, or pro problematic um, co conflict with uh, territorial sovereignty. Um, yeah, so you can imagine what kind of discussions were going on here in your, uh, remote sensing by satellites of territory of other countries. Next one, nuclear power sources. Um, the cause was the, the issue was an incident. Uh, a satellite uh, fell down on the ground of Canada and caused a lot of nuclear radioactive pollution on the ground. So it was needed to, the, to clearly explain where in which cases you can use nuclear power sources uh, without uh, too much danger and, and you know prepare for the risk and who should pay then and so on the cleanup. And the last the development 1969, 1996 was 
a so-called benefits declaration. It's called the benefits declaration, which aims to involve to a larger extent the developing countries because they felt more and more left behind. Um, there were only a few countries, a few countries who could afford uh, to uh, advance space technology and launch satellites and so on, and developing countries left behind. And still, uh, they wanted to be included and it's uh, and have the benefits and share the benefits of these activities because outer space should be used for the benefit and in the interest of all countries. Um, now I, I, I address the second point, so space agencies. What's the role of space agencies here? And this is sort of the first part of sort of private uh, actors. Are they private actors? They are not, not really private actors, but they are separate and separated from governments. Uh, they are agencies, they are usually also called agencies, uh, only that, for example, NASA is admin space administration, but it's itself, it's considering itself as an agency or and JAXA, for example, the Japanese space agency, DLR, the German um, Center for Air and Space is a German space agency and have Canada, China, Israel, UK, uh, Italy, Roscosmos, um, uh, very important space agencies. And they are separate uh, from government, but of course they are financed by the state. In that sense, they are related to the states and governments because they are funded by public money, but they are separate entities. And even uh, to the extent that, for example, Roscosmos announced uh, publicly that is, it is now privatized. So it's a privatized Roscosmos, which uh, want, they want to show that it's really a separate legal entity. We can, you know, un question under international law whether that's really true. But what we see indeed in the lawmaking process, in the lawmaking um, development, they are not government. So when we look at the COPUS, they are in the delegation of the countries. They are experts which um, advise the governmental representatives. So the governments are represented by diplomats, so the permanent representatives, for example, here in Vienna, but also often from capital. So they come uh, as for really from the government and to represent the, the, the position of the government. Uh, the government, of course, has a political mandate and presents the political position of the state. And this is not the role of the space agencies. They are experts. They are um, scientists, engineers. Um, they do not follow political goals, but technical goals. What they want is that things work. Yeah? So they are really the engineers, technicians, scientists. They want that things work and their um, ideas on the future development of technology works and is not uh, jeopardized or not hindered. That's their main interest. The governments sometimes, you know, have not almost this, always the same interest and not with the same urgency as we will see in the space debris context. So the space agencies have a technical pragmatic approach. In this sense, they are not governments. They are non-state actors in the broader sense. They can be called private. Um, now I go to this problem of space debris. I found it uh, uh, in, in the, in, on the internet as an illustration, which is not to scale. It's an artistic picture, but still it is somehow based on scientific data, but it, its purpose is to create awareness of the growing problem of space debris. Um, numerous, sometimes very small pieces of junk are orbiting the Earth, and they could have a major impact on space exploration and space use, and even make it impossible in the long term. They move with a very high speed, about 28,000 kilometers per hour, which is uh, quicker than a bullet. So it's uh, more, more, the, the speed is higher than a bullet. So it's really a dangerous situation. Space debris. Um, is created by three different sources. First, normal operations. Normal paint flakes, instrument covers, motor emissions, 
which are unavoidable, so to say, in normal operations. Second, they are non-functional spacecraft and orbital stages. So satellites are after their lifetime, for example. And third, fragments. So they consist, uh, they have um, emerged from breaks ups from spacecraft and orbital stages caused by malfunction during mission or explosions due to sources of stored energy, for example, or collisions of spacecraft or even intentional destruction of spacecraft. So the fragments are the third source of space debris. So here we see a graph provided by NASA, which also shows the concerning, uh, the really concerning increase. So not, this is not anymore an artistic, but this is scientific. Scientific data put together by NASA. And this is only the cataloged objects, but the number of cataloged objects is more than 19,000 currently. And uh, this is to be compared with 1,950, approximately 2,000 functional satellites. So we have 10 times more objects of space debris than functional satellites currently in space. Um, the, uh, a relevant number is also the estimated number, which is, for example, done by ESA. They say, well, this is nice to have these catalog objects. But in reality, what we have is 34,000 pieces which are larger than 10 centimeters. Not all of them can be cataloged or are cataloged. And then even the um, smaller pieces, which can only be estimated between one and 10 centimeters are 900,000. So the total mass of space debris is 8.4 tons, uh, 8.4 thousand tons, tons of space debris. So really a large amount. And you can imagine that the space agencies they want that things work, are increasingly concerned. So they created the Interagency Space Debris Coordination Committee. And this is one of the alternative fora that I want to mention. This is a not, it's not by governments, even though in the website, if we look at it, they call themselves intergovernmental forum, but it's not governments, it's space agencies. Uh, about the Forum of Space Agencies for the Worldwide Coordination of um, as Activities Related to Space uh, Debris, Man-Made or Natural, and they exchange information on space debris research activities between member uh, space agencies, and they facilitate opportunities for cooperation in that research and review the progress of ongoing cooperative activities and identify the pre-mitigation options. For them, space debris is really a pressing concern because they pose a great risk of damage and collision to any new space activity. The results are space debris mitigation guidelines, the very famous IADC space debris mitigation guidelines, which first have were published in 2002, but constantly adapted, adapted, adopt, yeah, updated. And I, the recent um, um, is here in 2019, which reacts already on the development of large, small, um, uh, large constellations of small satellites, which are a recent phenomenon. And the Interagency Space Debris Coordination Committee has re uh, reacted and um, included them in their update of the mitigation guidelines. First, as I said, they were published in 2002 and then 2007 and, and so on. They ha I have only one example put out here and uh, would like to uh, showcase of the, of the uh, difference, what we see in space law making here in this forum. And then we look at the COPUS, what is happening at COPUS. Um, they identified the LEO as a so-called LEO low earth object, a low, low earth orbit um, as a, a very um, a valuable orbit. It ranges up to an altitude of 2000 kilometers. And it is very um, valuable because it's uh, used by many countries for earth observation 
communications, space scientific observation and manned missions. In particular, the ISS, the International Space Station, is at an altitude of 360 to 400 kilometers, so quite below that. It's still low Earth orbit, so until 2000 kilometers it's low Earth orbit. And this is um, important to preserve this orbital environment, both for the use of this region, but also for passing through this region to the geo, the geostationary Earth orbit, which is far away, 36,000 kilometers and beyond that for space exploration. So if you cannot pass the LEO region, you cannot go anywhere. So it really must be preserved. So what to do? The, one of the key issues is that um, the end of the mission time should be limited. End of mission time should be limited. Um, and it, it shows here in the fourth, fifth line, this is the key, uh, key rule into an orbit with an expected residual orbit lifetime of 25 years or shorter. So that they don't stay in orbit forever, but something is done that they either are deorbited, de so that they are put down to the, uh, to the lower Earth orbit, and then they burn up. If they are small enough, they burn up fully. And even if uh, they do not burn up fully, then if you have, um, controlled re-entry, you can direct them to the uh, oceans, and then it's a controlled deorbiting. And this should be done in a period of 25 years after the end of mission. And then they have even more specificities of uh, the rate of success should be in at least 90%, and this must be proven at the beginning when you first just start. So the mitigation, space debris mitigation guidelines are uh, concerned with um, conditions before the object is launched at all, so that it is fit to uh, comply with those guidelines. So it's not about later cleaning up or so on, it's the preparation, the uh, sort of um, prevention of further space debris. So not, not yet, we are not yet in the stage of, of, um, of removing, but further space debris should be re reduced and limited, so mitigation or limited. And then there's even a, a more specific um, guideline for large constellations uh, or shorter, even shorter residual orbital lifetime on their higher probability of success may be necessary. And then retrieval is also a disposal option. So uh, this is the most recent uh, guideline which was added in 2019. So what is COPUS doing here? Is it uh, doing anything at all or rather uh, nothing or too little. Um, we, after the, the end of the General Assembly resolution, so to say in 1996, the last one, which we have, the Space Benefits de uh, Declaration, states have become increasingly reluctant to accept more obligations on the use of outer space. So treaty option seems to be out of the question. And even a UN General Assembly resolution, which is still an authoritative uh, recommendation is very difficult to get through. Why is that so? Because um, since the, the, the space age, the number of spacefaring nations has increased. So we have much more actors. Uh, and um, so not only the two spacefaring nations at the time of the Cold War, but more and more countries, and not, uh, in, in, not only European and North American, but also in other regions. And also developing countries want to have um, and increasingly want to participate. And they, uh, they are reluctant to accept more stricter, stricter rules uh, for their future activities because it would be, create a, a burden, a higher burden to them to enter in, these, in this field and to, to be active and also a benefit from, uh, from space activities if the rules get stricter and stricter. And they are reluctant to accept uh, that the industrialized states who have uh, in the past created all this debris uh, are now um, prescribing stricter rules for newcomers and prevent uh, effectively the news newcomers. And uh, so they should rather take responsibility for themselves and remove the space debris and to take other actions. So mainly now the resistance comes from developing countries, but not only, but also in the sense that any new rule, any new regulations would limit 
the possibility to to be active in outer space. And the still something happened in Copus. Um, the guidelines were presented in, but not in the legal subcommittee, but as you see in the second line in the STSC, the scientific and technical subcommittee. Uh, I think it's scientific and technical subcommittee yeah, in 2007. So they do not want to have it in the legal subcommittee even. Yeah? So the legal subcommittee didn't have it on its agenda. It was only apparently a scientific and technical question, but not a legal question. So that was the maximum it could, could, could be achieved. It was then the, the guidelines were then elaborated based on the IDC guidelines, endorsed by the UN General Assembly, but only as an annex. It was an annex of corpus. It was not, you cannot even call it a recommendation of the UN General Assembly um, because it was, it's uh, it referred to, as you see the title here, space debris mitigation guidelines of the committee on the peaceful uses of outer space. So it's not um, presented as a general assembly resolution. And it's voluntary guidelines, as it says in the, in the introduction, it's only voluntary. It reflects existing practices developed by national and international organizations and member states are invited to implement them through relevant national mechanisms. So it's voluntary, and but also the contents uh, is quite significantly different, namely much uh, looser, much less strict. So there is the similar guideline on the LEO region so limit the guideline six, limit the long-term presence of spacecraft at launch vehicle orbital stages in the low earth orbit region after the end of mission. So that's the guideline is kept somehow the title, but when we read uh, the explanation, uh, there is no mention of the 25 year rule. There's no mention of the 90% success rate. Uh, there is no mention of the, the, this, the post mission uh, time could be also shorter than that and other options. So it's very watered down, ob obviously watered down what the IEDC guidelines say. So that's the reality we, we face now. So the IEDC guidelines are stricter than what COPUS says because of these political reasons. And we may discuss later uh, uh, what can be done about it. Is there anything around it? Is it good or bad? Um, but this is the, the, the question we see. Uh, the official documents are watered down in contrast in confrontation to the uh, private, so-called private law, um, which is developed and the standards by the space agencies, by the actors concerned. The last example is uh, space resources. Uh, so where the private industry has in the last year, since like, I think it's uh, almost 10, 10 years ago when it started, uh, their interest started of private companies, mainly United States, uh, but also in other countries, as you see, so we have some countries wanted to become active in uh, space resource um, mining, as it is sometimes called, or space resource exploitation or space resource utilization, whatever you may call it. And what is this? It's about two things. Um, asteroids. So some are in particular concentrating on taking asteroids uh, taking the valuable metals, materials which are there and use them for commercial purposes, perhaps for bringing them down, but also for, for using them for our further missions in space. So perhaps, perhaps not, not necessarily bringing them down, but using those valuable metals and uh, minerals which can be found in asteroids. And the second uh, um, uh, option is the moon. So mining the moon, I space, for example, here in the middle, is concentrating on the moon and say, well, the moon has also resources which are valuable. Um, in the early times, it was helium-3, which was considered to be a, an important energy source, perhaps. It can be used perhaps for nuclear fission and energy creation. Currently, uh, the, con the, the focus is on moon water ice. So they found, found on the poles of the moon apparently large quantities of uh, water ice and this was of course a big discovery and the idea is to 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 use that water for permanent presence on the moon um, for human um, habitations they are also also for creating fuel for further space exploration missions so to go from the moon to to deep space 
and use the water ice as a fuel because it can you can create oxygen and hydrogen of it and then it's a it's a rocket fuel so quite interesting initiatives are they allowed or what what is going here what is going on specifically in um space uh, res uh, yeah and with a legal question of can you a private company use a space resource is that allowed or is it not allowed and under which framework and of, there was um the initial concern was created by the us law in 2015 which actually did allow the appropriation of space resources and also 2017 luxembourg followed with a national law allowing the space resource extraction and ownership uh, this uh, was uncomfortable for some parties of the moon agreement as for example the netherlands netherlands are state party to the moon agreement as austria is also and belgium for example and uh, mexico then we have pakistan we have turkey uh, a few countries but not uh, large space faring nations but nations like netherlands and belgium and austria which are considered about the rule of law and also the rule of law in international law and the rule of law in outer space. So it, they felt really uncomfortable with this development. So what to do? Um, apparently, there was not so much confidence in, in Corpus in the first place to put it there. So the Dutch government supported uh, this initiative of the International Space Resources Governance Working Group. It gave quite some financial support to the University of Leiden in the Netherlands. And so they should be the principal uh, actor and driver behind uh, the creation of this working group. And the other consortium partners were also universities and funds, so not really the, um, the industry. But the industry was then invited, you see the column of the, on the right hand, by being members and observers, but mainly members. They were invited to sit on the table with um, the universities and think and about and talk about a legal framework of space resource activities. And you see here, working group members are stakeholders of space resource activities and represent consortium partners, industry, states, some governments represent, for example, Mexico sent an official a representative, um, uh, the United States and uh, the Russian Federation were observers, but as a government. So they really sent governmental representatives, but only as observers. They, had something to say as observers and were of course carefully li listened to, but they were not members, but they had of course an important influence there. But what is interesting that industry was sitting around the table and, the, and NGOs and academia. So quite a mixed group of 35, um, you see here members uh, here creating something. And they created uh, building blocks for the development of an international framework of space resource activities in November 2019. Um, here <laughs> I present again um, co to confront the result of this private activity with an uh, UN um, activity or law. Here building blocks eight says well about resource rights the international framework should ensure that resource rights over raw material mineral and volatile materials as well as products can lawfully be acquired through domestic legislation, bilateral agreements, or multilateral agreements. The international framework should enable the mutual recognition of such resource rights, and the international framework should ensure uh, that the utilization of space, they call it utilization of space resources, they don't call it appropriation of space resources, it's only utilization, um, is carried out in accordance with the principle of non-appropriation under Article 2 of the Outer Space Treaty. So at least you see it's mentioned they know that there is an outer space treaty and that we should look at it. But what does the outer space treaty say? It says outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies is not subject to national appropriation by claim of sovereignty by means of use or occupation or by any other means. So you can see already that there is a large room for interpretation, whether this at all can be in accordance with article two. So the appropriation uh, of uh, if it's uh, not it's not allowed under Article 2. And we have also to think of Article 1 of the Outer Space Treaty, which says, well, 
exploration use of outer space should be um, carried out for the benefit and in interests of all countries, irrespective of the degree of economic and scientific development and shall be the province of all mankind. So not the province of some companies. Um, the last slide I think I have here is another example of safety zones. Here they want to create and allow safety zones for the extraction. Uh, of course, if you want to, to do some activity, you want to safe and have secure space that's uh, provided here, but Article out of one, uh, one out of space treaty says, well, uh, yeah, out of space shall be free for exploration and use by all states and shall there shall be free access to all areas of celestial bodies. So it's a safety zone uh, in accordance with uh, uh, the free access uh, to all areas of celestial bodies is a, a question. So I come to my conclusion, some points which I think can be already uh, uh, seen from my first uh, overview is, well, the welcome development, it's dynamic and effective and it responds to, to the uses and needs of stakeholders. The stakeholders are involved, they provide technical expertise and also scientific and develop, uh, development is fostered and they are easy to adapt. We have seen the IDC guidelines have been adapted to the recent developments. Unwelcome, it's un, quite unrepresentative. It's a, quite a, a, an arbitrary crowd, arbitrary chosen crowd of you know, who is there sitting on the table and making the rules. Uh, not inclusive, not transparent. It tends to serve the rich and powerful in, at the expense of the others. And it even may contradict existing international law. And this is what I now leave it for that time and would like to know your uh, in impressions and your your thoughts about this development and share it with me what you think about that thank you very much Imga, thank you very very much for a very interesting very exciting talk uh, i i definitely learned a lot and i think the same applies to uh, to our audience as well and uh, so we're going to now enter our questions and answers period before we do that i apologize for my sunglasses okay i lost one pair of normal glasses in the Danube on Saturday. My replacement uh, set of glasses I broke yesterday. So, so if I wanna see anything of what is happening, I have to wear these sunglasses, I'm sorry about this. Um, so um, I see a couple of hands are up already. And since we are quite a, a large crowd, perhaps really let's do it with a raising, raising the hand digitally. So that the, this, 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 this hand up. Um, once you have asked your question, please then uh, undo this raising your hand because otherwise I may get uh, confused, okay? So then we're going to start with Anna, please. Anna Reindl. Um, Well, thanks very, very much for this very interesting presentation. Um, you have mentioned the problematics of space debris, which I also find personally really, really interesting, especially because I also think that it will remain a problem in the future. And uh, for, of course, for, because of the rapid technological advancement, the commercialization and the danger it represents for um, other objects, satellites. But um, what I would be interested in, is there a connection to um, environmental law, environmental regulations in that sense? Because I can imagine that it not only um, poses a problem for other objects, satellites, but also for the environment as such especially uh, since it will, as I've already said, remain a problem in the future. So um, what is your opinion on that? Thank you. Anna, thanks a lot. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to bundle questions, if that's OK with you. I, I yeah. Yeah, I don't Let's always do, do batches of three. Then uh, the next one would be Alexandra, please. Yes, uh, I would also like to thank you for this interesting presentation. Um, my uh, question to you uh, regards uh, the fact that you said that after the launch of Sputnik 1, uh, there were a number of consequences in international law, such as the creation of the Committee on the Peaceful Use of Outer Space, and then um, the conclusion of the Outer Space Treaty in 67. And in my opinion, and please correct me if I'm wrong, one of the very first consequences in international law of this launch was um, the creation of the so-called instant custom, which was very highly debated uh, among the international community. And uh, 
as we know, most international treaties uh, tend to enshrine customs that are already existent. Uh, would you say that this was the case of um, these instant customs that uh, we are talking about? Alexander, thank you. And the next one on my list is Afan, please. Good evening. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, my question is regarding the 1992 resolution on nuclear sources. Uh, I was wondering, regarding the cleanup and retrieval of the source upon reentry, is the state on which its territory it lands responsible? Or is the origin state, or perhaps an NGO, to the extent uh, of compensating for costs and cleanup uh, or dec decontamination? I was just wondering who is responsible, depending on where it lands, or how has this been codified? Thank you very much. Afan, thank you. And then Irmgard, I'm going to hand the three questions over to you. Yes, thank you very much. First, environmental law influence and the long-term problem. I think it is so remarkable that the Outer Space Treaty of 1967 actually is the first environmental treaty. It mentions um, the obligation to avoid harmful contamination of the environment on Earth and in outer space in Article 9. So this is remarked in 1967, the term harmful contamination of the environment should be avoided. So we do have a hard law obligation here. And this is in connected then also with the strong and harsh, we can say, liability regime and responsibility regime. So in my view, when I also compare the outer space law and environmental law, I think uh, outer space law is even more advanced than current environmental law. Because under current environmental law, uh, the responsibility of the state which pollutes is very weak. So there is precautionary principle and whatever. And, but here we have liability and responsibility. So oh, even though the Article 9 is framed and formulated a little sort of vague and we can still interpret, uh, you know, wh which event really falls under this, uh, you know, the, the scope, but it's a, a, a remarkable trick. So I, I think the other way around, and, uh, but it's impossible probably, uh, environmental law should look at outer space law, how it is regulated. Because in fact, if uh, there is already this liability regime, and uh, so, but I think they work somehow closely together, and we 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 there are so there's no no harm principle, but the no harm principle is much weaker than liability. Yeah. So perhaps if you find an interest and in, you have an interest in environmental law, look at the space treaty and uh, and the space law how this works. And we can only try, or environmentalists can only try to achieve that level um, in the future, probably, uh, for environmental law. So uh, there is no question that this, this is even recognized by the most important spacefaring nations, including, of course, the United States, that they are liable and they are responsible. So, um, but um, um, still what we see uh, very little progress is done in, in, with regard to space debris in particular. So what we are now looking at is only liabilities, only let's say when something happens, you have to pay. So there is, might be a preventive function of liability law, but what be the, of course, the best, the next step is a pro prevention. So before the launch is allowed, before you get a, a license to launch, uh, environmental conditions or the space debris conditions should be met. And here the, the crux is. So that uh, at this level, uh, we have still too many, much, much too many licenses for launches of satellites which do not comply uh, with these rules or are danger for the environment. And only when something happens, we will talk about liability. And this is not very proactive. This is not in the, in the um, in the interest of prevention. So, but this is sort of the approach which, which uh, is now here. But even, if, even though we have the liability regime, the prevention uh, needs to be strengthened. That's the, for, true for the current status of uh, outer space law. The consequence of a Sputnik launch and instant custom, of course, this is always a, a, a 
controversial uh, issue in, in general public international law courses. Uh, I think that's um, a misunderstanding of terms and it's um, because what, what we really see and what was is that in reality the Sputnik uh, orbited around the earth and no state protested and said, well, you, you are not allowed to cross over my territory, it's, it's my territory, it's my airspace, you are not allowed to cross it. That's the traditional role we would think of air law or the traditional provision if you say, well, that's my airspace and uh, the airspace uh, is far uh, up um, in, the, in, the, in the altitude, as far as 100 kilometers that I can, uh, and the state below can prohibit um, you know, crossing that space. This was not the case and no state protested. And here we said, well, in a very short time, namely a few <laughs> orbits around the earth, it was apparently customary international law that it is not part of the territory uh, of the outer space is not part of the territory of the country. Um, that's, I think that that's, can be said for cus normal customer international law. But what is the, 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 the disputed um, cause here is that the enactment of the General Assembly resolution created instant custom or something like that. But that's, that's strange. I, I think this instant custom in the General Assembly resolution, we don't need that. We just say, well, it's state practice and they, they did not protest. And okay, opinion is probably because uh, they did not consider it as being part of its t the territory. So I think it's um, it's uh, the the, um, uh, the the struggle and dispute about this instant custom is uh, is superfluous in a way. We can just say it is customary international law, and the, only that the time it needed to to develop is short. It's only a few. Uh, or bits of Sputnik. Nobody protested. We don't need a new term for that. We don't need instant custom for that. It's normal. It's just customary international law. And and the sec the third about the nuclear power sources. Indeed, this was clearly and is clearly regulated in the Outer Space Treaty and the Liability Convention that the launching state is liable and it's absolutely liable, unlimited liability. And it was clear that in that case, uh, Russian, uh, that, that Soviet Union at the time, today the Russian Federation, the Soviet uh, satellite cosmos was crashing on the Canadian territory. And it was clear, and uh, Soviet Union did not deny that it was liable to pay. However, that the dispute was about how much. So how much uh, was the cleaning up cost really? And they, op uh, they for example, said, well, let us help you to clean up. We know what we what it's needed, and let us sort of help. And the Canadian said, "No, thanks. Uh, uh, we do it our own, and, and ask help from the U.S." And then the uh, the Soviet Union denied part of the compensation which was claimed. So it, uh, Canada claimed twelve million Canadian dollars, and um, the Soviet Union only paid three million. Uh, Canadian dollars, so only a fraction, but still it paid three million Canadian dollars, which uh, confirmed uh, the liability of the launching state. Imna, thanks a lot, and uh, there are lots of questions. So I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, do a bundle of five questions, if that's if that's okay. And uh, the first one is Dorothy, please. Hi, um, thank you for your presentation. So my question is. Um, is there a different benefit um, for establishing a presence in space if you are a developing country versus a developed country? Um, so, thank you. Thank you. And then uh, the next one is Ulrike, please. Yes, good evening and thank you very much for your presentation. I had a lot of questions. Many were already answered during your presentation, so thank you for that. Um, I think you were talking about the developing countries who were understandably against more laws which were, would regulate um, their launching. And I think this might be also the same for, for example, other commercial um, actors. Um, I think I read that there was, for example, one launch in 2018, which should be done in the US, but as the safety regulation was not 
uh, approved of, they just went to India and did it there. So I think I can understand why they don't want any more regulation. But I wondered if there is a sector where they actually do want, because I mean, private actors are more and more in space. Um, and for example, if I remember correctly, in the rescue and return agreement, um, they uh, they name a special a speci uh, specifically astronauts, but not private persons. So I wonder when we, when we know that probably in the future we have many more private um, persons in um, in space, whether there's a, an attempt also by private actors and com um, companies that actually this um, protection will be increased so that they will be covered in case of accidents or similar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ulrike. And uh, next one is Moges, please. Okay. Can you hear me? Very well. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening. I have uh, one question that is um, uh, given the advancement of technology, uh, do, do you believe that? Uh, the nexus between uh, cybersecurity and outer space law could be adequately addressed by the existing international law in regard to the space law regulation, if you got my question properly. Uh, not really. I mean, there was a little interruption. So uh, you mentioned cybersecurity and space law or so. Is there enough uh, protection or so? Yeah, exactly. Can we address the, uh, the uh, concern of cybersecurity by the existing space law? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then uh, it's Lioba, please. Um, hi, thank you um, for the presentation. I was wondering, you were talking about the use of resources in space and I was just, a question that I had is, is, is there a differentiation in the regulation between commercial use and um, uh, use for scientific purposes or um, that sort. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. And then uh, we have one more and it's Bernhard, please. Wonderful Good evening. Uh, thank you very much for uh, this very interesting presentation. Um, as a lawyer, I have a few questions in my head uh, regarding the intersection between international law and civil law. Now. So, um, Hoping to make this, um, uh, trying to make this as clear as possible. Uh, we sign a treaty that we extend our jurisdiction towards the moon. And we are on the moon, and we have the question of five companies who would mine there. So, if I would think now in civil law terms, which law do we apply? Every company would be strictly attributed to a country. We say there is an Austrian company, there is a German company, there is a company from the US. There would be the question of liability on the moon. There would be the question how to distribute um, goods everyone would like. For example, if everyone would like to have this specific water resource exactly at this position, mm -hmm. how do I settle a conflict? OK, we can say we make a court. Uh, with our um, with our treaty to settle conflicts, but finally, and uh, to be honest, that's my most um, uh, that's the most interesting question for me. Um, from a legal theoretic point of view, can I apply the civil law of uh, different nations, or can I apply a jurisdiction? How can I, in terms also of Roman law, try to um, apply a station um, on the moon. Um, I think my, my connection had some issues. Yeah, it had, it had, it had big issues, Bernard, but I, I hope that, that younger did you get yeah. the gist of the question? Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. I, I got the question, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. No, Bernard, thanks a lot. Sorry for the, for the, for the internet trouble there. Um, I'm going to hand over to you again. So that was five yeah. questions. Thank you very much. I tried to, to be uh, brief and to get you know to terms also for other questions. But first, different benefits of developing countries or developed countries. I mean, the benefits are different, but what the means are, are particularly different. So 
how much money can you and want do you want to invest in space infrastructure in the space uh, hardware and so on so uh, currently uh, the most sensible thing for and what also development countries demand is rather to um, participate in the results of space activities so get access to data for example of earth observation data yeah so the, in the um, in the remote sensing principles that's clearly laid down that uh, okay you may sense our country in africa but you have to provide us the data you, you collect for our purposes and the us for example is quite considered considerate of that and says okay yeah you can have this and then which terms and in which quality and and so of course but uh, the, the idea is and the most sensible use is um, to use uh, to get the data, get result. Uh, also, you know, the telecom. So the, the uses are earth observation, telecommunication, uh, navigation, the GPS, you know, uh, uh, data and uh, weather forecast data. Uh, so, so these are all data you get from the satellites. And it's, it makes a lot of sense for developing countries not the, to launch their own very expensive satellite, but just try to get access to the data and cooperate in that, that respect. And that's, that's a way forward. But increasingly, countries, even in Africa, also try to launch their own hardware. And of course, they put together a lot of effort to, to launch one satellite, a big one, a weather satellite, for example, or telecommunication or the small satellites as, as experimental satellites. And we have some, you know, in, in cooperation with um, Japan, for example, um, uh, African countries and Latin American countries have their small satellite projects, but it's it's really then a very limited educational project. So, but what, what is interest for them is then to get um, uh, learning outcomes for their students, for their young practitioners. So they participate in building a satellite and launching it so they know how to do it. And of course, in the long run, then they know, of course, how to use it and how to make the best use out of it. So that's the, the interest of developing countries. And um, this uh, should be kept in mind. Uh, but um, when they want to, to launch their own hardware, you see that the space, if they don't want to launch their own hardware, the, the space debris issue is, is not existent. The space debris is rather really about future launches and not so much about uh, data use. But uh, what is the really the big difference, and this I think it's in this area, the, uh, the, the, the different or uh, differences of economic of means and uh, technological know-how. So the, the, the divide between the, the haves and the not haves in space is enormous. But even uh, among other countries um, like European countries and the US, it's enormous. So the, the budget of the US is so much higher than, than the European altogether. Uh, that that's already an inequality we see, and that's a reality, a, a, a really impressive inequality of means uh, and 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 assets also in, in space. But also the dependence of the United States of these assets is increasing, and that's uh, disturbing them because they depend even always more on their space assets. And if something you know, even a small satellite like our university satellite can crash into a, a NASA satellite, and it's it's gone, yeah, <laughs> it's destroyed. So their their risk is also very high. The, um, then uh, the second is developing countries uh, and also uh, um, other countries who uh, have this reluctance to to accept more more rules in the commercial actors. It depends on, on, on which activity, because sometimes when we see space resources, uh, there is also mutual interest or self-interest that there is some regulation. Because if they don't have legal security, they cannot do anything. So legal security and legal certainty and legal framework is important for commercial activities as well. So they, uh, they, it's not that so much that the commercial actors are against new regulations. In, I would even say on the opposite, they want a clear legal framework. That's why they pushed the US actually to, to uh, public uh, to develop and, and enact the law on space resources because they needed legal certainty. US cannot do give it to them because it's an international <laughs> area, but uh, that was the first step. And the ARA, uh, uh, the, it's the, the nickname of the uh, agreement on the rescue and return of astronauts, whether this applies to space, uh, to, to private uh, persons is uh, already discussed in the literature and in practice, and there, 
there are perhaps some doubts, but the overwhelming uh, reaction, the overwhelming view is that it is applicable already to private persons because it has a, a largely um, humanitarian purpose. So the safety and res rescue of, of astronauts is, is uh, uh, not connected to their, to their uh, quality as a state sort of representative. Of course, in the past, they have been part of even of the military. Yeah? Astronauts have often been a part of the military. But the, the object and purpose of the rescue agreement is mainly humanitarian. Uh, and there are only some provisions which do not fit, perhaps, because, the, for example, the astronaut should be returned immediately to the launching state, should not be kept uh, either as a spy or given him a very uh, well-paid job <laughs> to, to stay in the country and you'll give all his knowledge to the other country. So the immediate return is, is uh, included in, in the ARA, in the rescue agreement, which is perhaps not, does not make so much sense in, uh, uh, in the private uh, context. But it was discussed actually for the, for example, the refugee status and so it was discussed whether that's really true that the astronaut should immediately be returned if he has a right to ask for asylum <laughs> in the country. Um, but um, this has been discussed, but the return has, has prevailed. But primarily humanitarian aspects, and, and I know a lot of you know, publications who support uh, that also private persons are covered by the rescue agreement. Um, then the third, the cyber security, if it's covered by space law, uh, rather not. We consider now the, the law of cyberspace is not covered by public international law, hardly, but rather by private international law. What are the rules which are applicable are, you know, related to national rules on safety, on privacy and so on, so national laws. And the, the question of cyber security is, is, is which law is applicable. So that's the main the starting point. Public international law only comes into play when a cyber attack, for example, can be regarded as an armed attack. Yeah. So when it, it raises to that level, and then we have public international law and international relations uh, uh, come into play. But the normal and ordinary uh, um, regulation of cyber law is done on the private law basis, private international law. So not so much space law. There has been some discussion, but that's the overwhelming, it's still a an, an, an developing area, I must say, uh, um, cyber law. And there are, I know, for example, if you are interested in the Institute of Air and Space Law in, in Cologne, at the University of Cologne, uh, recently, or two years ago, um, enlarged its scope of research to also cyber law. So from their perspective, yes, it does connect. It, uh, there is connection between space law and cyber law. But th that's uh, an, an, an attempt. It's not yet very clear to what extent this interacts. Yeah? Because yeah, it's a lot about data and the recipients of data and so on. Yeah, but perhaps not. you look at perhaps the Cologne Institute of Air and Space Law and Cyber Law that you may find you know, interesting documents and international research uh, projects which are going on there. Um, resources, uh, difference between commercial and scientific use. Good question. The Moon Agreement, for example, it's the most strict re regime on, on, on the use of sources and most, in a way, advanced and in, on an international law basis. It, it does, of course, differentiate. It says for scientific purposes, you may take examples and you may uh, take examples, a sample return is possible. And indeed, um, the United States in its, its Apollo program returned quite significant amounts of moon rocks. I have, I, I think it's 60 kilos or so. 60 kilos, yeah, kilograms of, of moon rock. And they um, used it for science and they also gave it away and as, as a present, so for free, some, you know, the Austria, I think, has also, yeah, has also one moon rock. And, and you know, 
they used it for scientific purposes. And this was um, unproblematic for everyone. Now the analogy the US is drawing is saying, well, at that time, apparently, you have already accepted there is property possible uh, of moon rock. So it was considered as property of the United States, they argue. And it was shipped around the countries and it was accepted that the uh, US has the moon rock and gives it away. So why should you now be against uh, appropriation of moon rock or other moon resources? But when we then go on and read the moon agreement for the exploitation of space resources, it's clearly said there has to be an international regime, an international legal regime. And what they had in mind at that time was the regime of the deep seabed. Yeah, so the idea is that it's a common heritage of mankind and it, yes, can be exploited even commercially, but only under an international legal regime. And for the uh, deep seabed, we have, of course, the, the deep seabed authority in Jamaica and it, it uh, administers, uh, I think right now, it's 30 contractors who have an interest in, in mining the deep seabed. And so this is the idea because the term is similar, uh, the same common heritage of mankind, that also there should be perhaps an authority uh, of international law which uh, administers these contracts. So, you know, interested companies may make an application and get a license. Um, so he, this is for commercial uses under the Moon Agreement. Certainly there is a difference. Now in the Hague group, um, they say, well, it's utilization of space resources and this is allowed. And, and they do not distinguish between scientific and commercial use. But this can be, you know, challenged. Um, now, the last thing is international law and civil law. Uh, how is, you know, how under which uh, uh, legal framework are companies operating, for example, on the moon? Uh, there is quite clear regulation of um, uh, Outer Space Treaty, which says every space object, so to say, is covered under the jurisdiction of its launching state. So if a company is operating there, you ask, where do you come from? Okay, you are an Austrian company. You have, you were launched from the US, for example. So you have two launching states. But the question is then who has registered? So if Austria has registered the space object, uh, there is always this link of jurisdiction. So you have always the national law ap applicable there. So like a flag state in a way, yeah? a flag state on the high seas. So the ship, uh, 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 flying, uh, going under this flag is, is subject to the jurisdiction of the flag state. If there are conflicts, that's an open question. And that's why the Hague Group is so, it was quite successful and, and you know, pro provided this result rather after a few years only, because this was exactly their problem. They say, well, we know we have some laws in outer space, but we do not know how to interact uh, on the surface of an asteroid or of the moon, if we both want to, to, to look for minerals in the same place. And that's why the whole building blocks are, are, uh, are drawn um, about uh, these problems. And for example, what they have uh, introduced is the idea of a registration and prior registration of rights. So you get a, a possibility to register your interest at a certain place, and this has to be respected by the others. Yeah, so priority rights, they call it priority rights, but it's their own, that's a new invention. They have just invented it in the Hague. It's, it's, there's not, no other legal basis for that. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. The audience, by the way, has no mercy on you, so there are more questions. <laughs> and I also have some questions, but, but let, 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 me, let me go with the, with the audience first. And the next one on my list, so we're probably going to arrive at five again which uh, will be the, the final round of questions. So anyone who's still interested in, 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 in raising an issue and asking a question, uh, please do so now. And uh, the first one on my list now is Karina. Hello, and thank you very much for your talk. My first question is, so you mentioned the rock and the water of the moon and also the, the rock of asteroids. So what if one country decided to mine kind of all of the resources, what could be done against that, um, considering the soft law um, part of international law? 
And also interrelated with that, um, is it possible to still somehow prevent the appropriation of, um, of uh, materials of the space until all of the countries are ready to actually exploit them? And then I have one question which is a bit off and which relates to the fact that there is no legal overall definition of outer space thus far, but there's a functional and a spatial approach. So which one do you personally prefer? Which one makes more sense? Thank you. Thank you, Serena. And uh, the next one is Esther, please. Thank you so much, Professor, for your presentation. And uh, I saw that there are new development when it comes to addressing transparency and also confidence building measure. And uh, right now, the European Union um, is considering having um, introducing an international code of conduct for space activities. And my question is, what are the measures that are discussed in that new code when it comes to transparency and confidence building? Thank you. Thank you, Esther. And then uh, Anthony, please. Yes, hello, thank you. Um, my question is rather brief, but I want to ask if there would be what applicable comparison there might be with Antarctica, which has somewhat um, gained a special status in international law where it's very restricted to primarily research purposes and um, how would that compare to space and the future of how that will be, um, if we can use the term carved up perhaps um, in terms of access by specific nations or actors. Thank you. Anthony, thank you. And, uh, and Irmgard, if I may ask uh, three questions that I'm just very, always very interested in, in, in myself. And since I really don't know anything about space, I have to ask you these questions, although they don't relate all that much to your talk, actually. And they are, they are about the, the concept of peaceful use. So that's, in, 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 uh, as I understand, there's in, in quite a few of those, those documents is also mentioned. And is that ever defined? Uh, so is it defined what, what peaceful use is? would be my first one? The second question is, is there any debate about that? Uh, so scholarly debates or, or debates on the, on the diplomatic stage. And the third one, uh, what are the chances of, 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 uh, of, of uh, this peaceful use being upheld actually? So uh, because there's, so in, in terms of uh, arms races and everything, there, there are all kinds of scenarios, of course, about what could happen. Yeah, very good questions. But I, if I counted correctly, uh, the student okay. questions were only three. Yeah, and you. Yes. Have, <laughs> I don't know if have, we have the time. I don't know if we are do time constraints. I don't know, uh, half past or so. We should yeah try probably. Yeah. 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 Okay. But we have <laughs> some, some indulgence. Okay. Um, and a rock or water on the moon or asteroids. Uh, if one country takes all the resources, yeah. Um, what happens? I mean, it's a, a question um, of, you know, law and effect and law in a way. Um, I think why, why, why something is going on, many things are going on in the resource sector, also including the Hague group and why the US were so active, even only as observer, but they, were, they didn't miss any, any meeting. They were always there um, and influenced the discussion. So, because they realize that they will not be the only ones any longer. So far, they have been the only ones, uh, at least sending humans on the moon. Others have sent rovers, but the capacity of China, for example, and also Japan uh, um, you know, has increased remarkably. And so they, they are, as, as in the past times, they were interested in having an agreement with the Soviet Union you know, now they are very interested in assuring that there is some framework that, that not the Chinese are doing whatever they want and are out of control. So there is an interest of these actors to have um, some rules of the game um, on the, the moon and on asteroids, uh, because the US knows even with their still the most much more powerful nation in the, in the space, they are not the only ones. So they have an interest in, in this regulatory regime. And they make, uh, perhaps I should mention here this, uh, make a, a impressive efforts 
now in the last half year or so to conclude the so-called Artemis Accords. I don't know if you have heard about them. The Artemis is a follow-up of Apollo. Apollo Artemis is the si twin sister of Apollo in the Greek myth myth mythology. And so the sisters, they want to bring a woman on the moon, the next, uh, next step. And the Artemis Accords are the framework for very concrete plans for the moon, including the lunar gateway, uh, which is a, a rotating, should be a rotating space station around the moon. And they have um, a lot of partners already. So they are interested in, partic in partnering with Japan, with even UAE, not China. Interesting, China is never in, in included. It's not part of the ISS. It is not part of the Artemis Accords of the Lunar Gateway. We will see what, you know, what effect this will have. China has already said, okay, then we build our own space station. We don't need you. <laughs> we can we build our Chinese space station. So, but uh, that's, you know, the reality, how it is currently, the, who negotiates with whom is, is we can observe here. And Austria, in a way, is indirectly represented via ESA. Uh, we are in, in, in this big group of the ESA countries, 22 countries of ESA, and ESA has indeed already concluded uh, the Artemis Accords with uh, the NASA. So that's uh, so the, the actors are here, you know, interesting to observe. Um, then to prevent appropriation until all states are ready. I mean, not all, and we have always this handful of states who are ready and in the, in the position to do anything. And, and what is the beneficial thing I would see here in Vienna with the cook was that at least there is a regular forum to meet and discuss and also challenge. I mean, the developing countries are, you know, quite organized and quite uh, vocative and say, well, on behalf of uh, 70, group of 77 in China, we say this and that, and the Latin American group says this, and the African group says this, and it's quite powerful, and then the US and, and Russian Federation, they you know, give an answer, give a statement, you know, have to react. And, and that's a very beneficial and very positive uh, way. I think this forum of exchange, of regular exchange of also confidence building, because you know the people over the years, the actors, so not only the governmental representatives, which change from administration to administration sometimes, but the space agencies as well. So, uh, ah, interesting. China just announced that they are going to collaborate with Russia in their outer space program. Yeah, because China, you know, and then Russia is also currently not part of the Artemis Accords. It was in the ISS at the last moment. It was, you know, stepped in. It is part in the International Space Station Agreement, but not yet in the Artemis. And it's it's possible that the Chinese and, and Russians are, you know, forming a new, uh, you know, uh, pillar here uh, um, to counter these efforts of the US um, with their partners. Um, so what where was, uh, I was of Copus, yeah, so that this is really important to, to have this exchange and current confidence building. Um, and um, the last uh, sub question was here, the non-legal uh, definition of outer space. I have observed the discussion over the years in Copus. It's currently, it's always uh, continuously on the agenda. And the countries have their particular uh, positions, uh, which don't seem to be very flexible and, and changed. So the developing countries in Russia say, well, we need this clear definition about 100 kilometers. And the Western countries, uh, NASA, but also European countries say, uh, generally, we don't need it. We have a functional approach. We know what is a space activity and we know what is an air activity and also the air um, activities are defined by function. So uh, the air, Chicago convention rests on the definition of an aircraft. So whatever can fly by, you know, by aerodynamic lift is an aircraft. Uh, so that's, um, that's a, the comparison is here that, you know, spacecraft is, needs a rocket engine. So it cannot uh, move by aerodynamic lift. So um, that's the main difference of the, you know, the activity. And uh, so we know what is, in a way, what is a space activity and what is an air activity. And I think also that it's um, for the international legal regime, not really necessary. I would think it would be good in, in principle to have to agreement, to agree on like a law of the sea, 
to put, they took nine years to codify the law of the sea. The law of the sea convention started, you know, the development of the discussion in 1973 was finished in 82. And so they were great achievement of a huge document and they agreed on everything. And such a thing could also be beneficial for outer space. Then you could also, for example, agree on something like an exclusive economic zone, which we don't have in outer space, but probably we would need it because it's it's um, because we have like the territorial sea, so to say, is only the airspace. So when you say, well, how far can an, an aircraft is only until like 30 maximum, 27 kilometers, you know, or 10, the air, civil air liners go 10 kilometers. So uh, military go to 27 maximum. And then, but the proposed, proposed limit is 100 kilometers. So we still don't know what is between the, the 20 or 30 and 100. What is there? Is it airspace? No, what well, doesn't make sense. So we need something like an exclusive economic zone, I would say. And then we can say beyond 100 kilometers, we have like the high sea, we have uh, outer space. But uh, and when we don't have this com com comprehensive um, possibility to exchange the views on the delimitation de issues, it's strange just to fix the outer space line when we don't know what is between uh, 30 kilometers and 100 kilometers. Should it be, really be airspace? I think nobody would really think about that as, as a, a good solution. You cannot control it. What is, you know, so currently uh, when we don't have this comprehensive negotiations, we have to, I think I will live with this functional approach uh, quite well. Some states, but I think it's interesting, some states, even Western countries, including Denmark, including Australia, they have included in their national law, the 100 kilometer limit. Because they say, well, we need to know where is outer space, what is the space activity, so they have it. They say, well, our activities are, you know, this covered under the national space law, which go further than 100 kilometers. So that's a, a, an interesting phenomenon. Uh, we in Austria don't have that, we have deviated the definition. Um, but no, yeah, it was not asked from us, which I perhaps have, have, would have expected that some of our national lawyers would say, well, that's not determined enough. That's, uh, yeah, that's a problem, but okay, we are not challenged so far, uh, so we don't have that. But it's a possibility without directly defining outer space. When you say our law is applicable uh, for any activity which goes beyond 100 kilometers, that would be the same as Denmark has done. So, so I think that's, that's my opinion. I think my opinion would be to, to find, uh, to have a good, uh, real uh, um, uh, comprehensive treaty, which would um, deal with this, including the new regimes on space research. But that's perhaps a very fictitious thought. <laughs> Thank you. And then transparency and confidence building measures. Uh, and uh, there was a draft code of conduct by the EU. Unfortunately, uh, I don't know if it's controlled, but it failed a few years ago dramatically. I was there uh, when they tried to finalize it. And it was, uh, it was very, um, badly prepared or per perceived in the, from the beginning, because what was the main, um, the main problem that it mixed uh, the language of disarmament with the uh, language of peaceful uses of outer space. So what Marcus' this question is now about. And uh, currently we have the disarmament discussions in Geneva on the prevention of an arms race in outer space. And so what, you know, it's about what is self-defense and so these things. And what, in the peaceful uses uh, committee, the word defense or so is never used or uh, if you like the code of conduct had had um, a formulation of uh, recognizing the the inherent right of self-defense in outer space people were shocked what does it mean what do you want that you shoot the satellites down because you are considered to be uh, an, an, a, 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 a military object and then you create space debris so the environment of outer space is so different that this talk, uh, these formulations and these, these terms do not fit and, and really have, have shocked the space community. So it really failed, uh, uh, you know, dramatically. And um, what the EU, EU is now doing and, and, and have, they have understood that this was a, a, an error and, and a mistake. They were not very experienced at that time. The EU has uh, only recently a competence in space since the Lisbon Treaty 2009. And uh, they probably, you know, have not really considered the, the, the subject uh, uh, well enough. And 
now they have learned a lot and I think it's better what they now try to have more the principles of um, uh, responsible behavior are now more and uh, it's about safety, three S, safety, sustainability and um, I think the three S, yeah, security or so, but it's, it's they try to rephrase it, reframe it. It's an ongoing process and it's still very unsecure how it will go on. Um, how it will work because yeah they ha you have to match the two the two um, frameworks of the p space people and the peaceful uses and the, the engineers and scientists of you know NASA and so on and then you have on the other hand the DOD the D Department of Defense and all the defense community and this that's not really they don't speak the same language uh, so that's really that has to be tackled. Um, uh, Antarctica parallels, um, uh, interesting, yes. The Antarctic Treaty, they also tried in 1989 with the Wellington Convention, which you still can find in the internet and I was recently retrieved it. A Wellington Convention, a fully formulated convention about the resource mining of Antarctica. Yeah, so they said, well, if, what is, if we find oil and you know hydrocarbons and so, what could be the, the principles and so and some environmental protection, but still it should be allowed. It was fully negotiated, but no one signed it, no and no one ratified it. And it was just, you know, um, thrown away. And instead came in 1991 the environmental protocol, which totally prohibited the exploitation of natural resources. So it was 180 degree shift in, in the policy. So no, we don't touch resources, we protect the environment and the environmental protocol prohibits the taking of natural resources. And it's interesting to observe, uh, perhaps this can be also the case for outer space. I don't know, we are still currently under this, in the phase of the Wellington Convention when it was negotiated, <laughs> so before 89. And we will see when perhaps we will we, we'll see a, a fully fledged framework of space resources and perhaps two years later, there will be a protocol saying no, there is no, no, no space resources can be um, exploited, we prohibit it. It can happen. It's a political development which happened in Antarctica and which may happen in outer space as well. And it's not so, I don't know, if to give the chances, I don't know. Um, depends who wants to continue with space resource mining. Because the, the private industry, which I uh, have shown you on the, one of these slides, two or three of these companies are already bankrupt. So they don't exist any longer. Um, so they will not lobby any longer for this. It will only continue if also NASA, and it seems like that, wants to continue with that. And in the Artemis Accords, they, they want uh, space resource to be appropriated and used. So the private industry is out, so to say, because of lack of money. But NASA, of course, in continue has, uh, continuously has the state money and they probably continue with that. Um, but uh, we don't know. So currently there is a pro-exploitation trend still, but it can also shift as you have seen in, in Antarctica. A peaceful, Peaceful use. Now I start with Marco's questions and look at the watch. Okay, peaceful use. Uh, it is not defined, and it is a constant. Uh, in a way, is it constant a debate? No. First, the first question is: Is it defined? And second is: What is the debate about it? First, it is not uh, um, defined, and you have a lot of literature, of course, from the beginning about it. What does peaceful use mean? Um, the signal which should be put uh, to the world when the Sputnik was launched and the UN uh, General Assembly sat together and uh, to drafted the first resolutions on peaceful uses was, don't be afraid, Sputnik is not uh, a further um, uh, arms race. It's not a military threat. It's not, uh, it's not a threat of weapons of mass destruction uh, being put in orbit around the earth and being a constant threat to the whole humanity. So the signal um, should be clearly to the world peaceful use. So no arms race, no weapons of mass destruction in orbit. That should be clear. And then everyone agreed. 
but when we look what it is what is really meant uh, certainly it is not meant civil use from the first moment or let's say in first months it was clear that um, satellites will be used for military purposes earth observation mainly military satellites were used from the beginning so nobody would translate peaceful purposes with civil use no so what does it mean it's, it can be military use but military use in accordance with the chart of the united nations meaning a military use but not for aggressive purposes but for defense purposes yes so as long as it's used for yeah, earth observation, surveillance, um, so normal sort of preparation of a possible attack in the future, it is, it is allowed. So uh, non-peaceful use of will be an aggression and the only exception is Article 4 of the Outer Space Treaty and also previously the Principles Declaration, which was immediately uh, so drafted rather before the, the treaty became uh, entered into force. The, placement of nuclear weapons and weapons of mass destruction in orbit is prohibited. This is the agreement. That's the bottom line. But any uh, tra uh, conventional weapon may cross uh, outer space. So this missile, intercontinent missile may cross sort of outer space. And, and um, if you can station conventional weapons in outer space, actually it does not really matter because every satellite is po uh, potentially a weapon anyway. You can put, as, any, as I say, it's like a quicker than a bullet. Every satellite is potentially a weapon. So if you call, call it uh, like uh, Reagan, uh, his program, um, you know, the putting in missile defense initiative, it doesn't matter because every satellite can be a weapon. And it would be a sort of conventional weapon. It would be not a weapon of mass destruction. Um, so that's how we live with it. It's, it means peaceful in the sense of in accordance with the Charter of the United Nations, meaning um, the threat or use of force is um, prohibited against uh, in, in the relations between states. And currently, the second question, is there a debate about it? It's a, you can, it, I would answer this question a bit differently, namely now, um, indeed, the question is, uh, can we separate the, the military uses and um, the civil uses any longer. When we have the reality of dual use of all, almost all space uh, assets and space technology is dual use, potentially being used for both um, purposes. Earth observation is for mapping, cartography, and of course also military um, 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 surveillance. And uh, what we see there is um, the Copos in Vienna tries to to widen its scope of regulation so to be the primary and, and larger entity to regulate safety and security concerns there because we see in Geneva the, under the disarmament uh, title nothing uh, can be achieved and has been achieved in the last years and they constantly talk about a prevention of an arms race in outer space on the treaty or general assembly resolution and no consensus is, is envisaged. But when you talk, take it from the angle of Vienna and say, well, it's only about safety and long-term sustainability, we still can cover also dual use things and, and military uses because it's about safety of satellites and you know long-term sustainability. And I think that's a good path. I think if things shift to Vienna, in a way, in that sense, uh, sort of uh, um, literal, in a way, uh, to describe it like that, that the Vienna-based uh, uh, outer space community is the one uh, traditionally mainly concerned you know, with civil uses, but if it enlarges its scope on safety and long-term sustainability, will also cover uh, uh, military uses, which is already done for the registration, for example. The registration is already also required for military satellites, and the compliance is not so as bad as we would expect. Yeah, so we have quite a good compliance with registration, even of military satellites. The last one: chances of peaceful arms race in outer space. So I think that was a little bit the, the question three. The arms race in outer space is the Geneva topic, and the what we see from there, it's or has been a deadlock for so many years, 
and it has not been uh, able to achieve any result while Copus has achieved a lot of results in the last years. It's not what I showed here, the last general assembly resolutions are not the last ones. It has developed various recommendations on national space legislation, for example, how to implement, um, um, how to, or that other one is about international cooperation. So it has um, delivered results. So I think uh, things are moving more in, in Vienna and if Vienna is keeping that uh, spirit and confidence which it has by member states, it has a very, let's say, good reputation among states, then, then there is a possibility of, uh, even the space resources topic and so can be, has a chance of being, of being discussed there with some, with support by member states. Imga, thank you so much. Uh, so uh, you've answered lots and lots of our questions. If I count correctly, it was 14 of them. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you for a great talk. Uh, under normal circumstances, again, there would be a big round of applause. And uh, like this, we can only uh, thank you. And thanks a lot, uh, really, for, for a super exciting talk. It was very interesting. I learned a lot and for answering all of our questions. And uh, we're obviously going to continue in the, in, the, in the lecture series very soon. Uh, in, in, uh, in April, May, we're going to have more talks and uh, focusing uh, um, in particular on particular issue areas of international affairs uh, and especially at issue areas that are sometimes a little bit overlooked. Outer space, I think, was a very good example for that. There's really a lot happening and it's a very important subject, uh, but many of us have probably not heard all that much about it before. So thanks a lot for listening in again. I uh, hope to see, to see you soon again uh, when it comes to these um, UFG Peaceful Change uh, lectures, uh, then with my new pair of glasses. And, uh, and Jungard, thanks again. Many, many, many thanks for giving us a great talk. Thanks. Thank Have you very much for the invitation, for your interest. Uh, that, that's great for me. Thank you. <laughs>